That's not fair. You know, if you spend a bit of time around kids, playing and crying and doing whatever they do, you're going to hear that phrase plenty of times. Four words. And the reason you'll hear it is because humans have an innate sense of justice and fairness. I want to ask us some questions today and I want you to think about it. What is the origin for the desire for justice? What makes an act or a situation right or wrong? What is the path to the best human life? And how can we enjoy the good life? Because those questions flow out of that cry. You see, all these questions flow from the depth of the human heart. They all come from who we are and what we think and how we interact with the world. I've got some bad news again this morning, guys. The world is transitioning out of an ethical framework that's defined by the Judeo-Christian faith. It's transitioning out. The biblical worldview that we have uh, probably grown to accept and to become a part of is disappearing into a postmodern pool. In fact, the census, the Australian census, tells us that. We do a census every five years. I don't know if you realise that. The last one we had was in 2016. And in 2016, what we discovered is that just over 50% of the population identified with the Judeo-Christian faiths, with those two great systems. And in essence, what that means is that we were tied to... Uh, the Ten Commandments, that our ethical system was based on the Word of God and that we had a foundation or an absolute for the things we believe. And so when we say that's not fair with a, with a mindset that's rooted in Scripture, then we ha actually have a framework for defining that. So what's taken place? Well, in the last five years, and we're about to do another census next month, by the way, what we will discover, I believe, and I'm, again, it's not great news, is that the next census will show us that since 2016, we've gone from having a population of just over 50% who identified as Christian to a population that will be just below 50%, and it may be substantially below 50%. So we're going to lose the balance of power. The other scary thing about 2016 is that over 30% of the population now do not have any faith in a God whatsoever. So you can do the maths. There's about 20% other than those two numbers that believe in other religious systems. Again, what we'll discover at the next census, next month, and it'll, the results will come out later on, is that that 30% number will probably have increased to substantially higher in terms of the number of people that don't believe in God or any God. And so the perspective that we have on ethics has been disconnected from the sacred canopy of Scripture that's been in place for over 2,000 years because it's gone right back to the days of Moses. The most basic rule of human activity for a 21st century person is to maximise your personal freedom and to limit the harm caused to others that comes through your personal freedom. That's essentially where people fit when it comes to ethics nowadays. And even the second part of that statement is doubtful. In other words, a lot of people don't really care what happens to other people as long as I'm okay. So what, again, it's a question... What is an appropriate and helpful way for you and I to interact in a world that has rejected traditional foundations of ethics and morality in favour of a self-assessing system? Now, you guys that are teachers or have been in education, you know that self-assessment doesn't work. Either on the one hand, you're going to have students that come down on themselves heavily and don't mark themselves up, but there's probably going to be a far greater number of kids that will mark themselves way over the top. 
So self-assessment doesn't work. And yet, that's what we've done with the, es with the ethics system. So again, this morning, what we're doing is following on from last week. Remember I said that over the next few weeks, we'd be looking at broadly the question, what in the world is going on? Well, this morning, we're looking at ethics, and it's a really important area. You might think, well, this is going to be a dry old talk, but ethics are important. We don't even realize that we're plugged into them. In John chapter 17 and verse 16, Jesus said, speaking of his disciples and now us, they are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. So we're not here by accident. We're here because we've been sent. We're here because Jesus has willed it that we be here. You've heard me say tongue-in-cheek before that if we weren't meant to be here, Jesus would have gotten you saved and then he would have shot you and sent you to heaven straight away because that way you wouldn't have time to sin. But I want to challenge us this morning to try and work out how much of our personal morals and ethics we've derived from the world, we've actually taken from the world, and whether or not our morals and ethics are in line with a biblical worldview. This is one of those times where we hold a plumb line against our lives and go, are we measuring up? Are we actually standing vertically? Or are we a freak of nature? We're walking along on a, on a bit of a lean. My dictionary tells me this. Firstly, it says that ethics are moral principles that govern a person's behavior or conductivity of an activity. So morals relate to your personal behavior. Sorry, that was ethics. Ethics are moral principles that govern a person's behavior. Morals, on the other hand, are standards of behavior, principles of right or wrong. Now, when you look at those two definitions, you go, well, there's, there's only a half a shade of difference, if anything. But then it's summarized by this. Ethics and morals relate to right and wrong conduct. While they are sometimes used interchangeably, there are, they are different. Ethics refer, refer to rules provided by an external source, codes of conduct in workplaces, or principles of religion. Morals refer to individuals' own principles regarding rights, right and wrong. So we are all people of morals. We live by a certain moral code. For church people in the 21st century, this thing's becoming much more confusing. Because we're now in conflict. We have two sets of rules speaking to us. And it, if it sounds like you're going crazy, you're, you're in good company. Because we're hearing voices from all around the place when it comes to the moral code. A biblical code of ethics and morals will always bring true Christians like you and I into conflict with this world. We shouldn't be surprised when we come under fire from the world and we'll come under fire on many issues, including but not limited to marriage, relationships, family, sexuality, abortion, money, justice. The list goes on. In other words, anything that we're involved in life that requires a moral compass, we're going to come into conflict with the world. Again, in John 15, Jesus said this. He said, If you belonged to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Underline that last bit. The world hates you. The world hates you. The world hates you. We live in a world that is absolutely going berserk at the moment. And it would rather that we weren't in the world and one day it'll get its wishes. But not just yet. You see, we don't belong here. I said this last week. We don't belong in the world. This world is dead. It died in the Garden of Eden. And we've been maintaining it ever since. We're not of the world any more than Jesus was of the world. Again, he says this in John 17, verse 4. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. 
John also cautioned believers not to love the world. He said this in 1 John 2 and verse 15. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's a pretty heavy statement, isn't it? If we love the world, if we're attached to it, if we're invested into it, if our emotional and financial and our, all of our energies are devoted to this world, the Bible teaches us that the love of the Father is not in us. That's a full-on statement. John went on to describe what he, meant, what he meant by this, to do not love the world, in 1 John 2 and verse 16. He said, For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but out of the world. So 2,000 years ago, the writers of the New Testament recognized that those two voices that we hear were from opposing value systems. John referred to the world's values and its ethical system when he said, do not love the world. It's dead, it's dying, RIP, we're out of here. So what I want to do right now is to look at the two systems of ethics that we live in. And I want you to then decide where you fit in that uh, continuum because it'll probably shock you. A lot of us will identify with the world because we've been so accustomed to living in it. And so this morning, hopefully, we're going to just hang that plumb line and come back into line with, with where God wants us. And so up until very recently, as I mentioned before, the Bible actually informed the entire Western world and much of what we call the Far East or the developing world, or the rest, the two-thirds of the world, actually, that exists outside the Western world. And the Bible was our guide for ethics and morals. In other words, it set the big rules, it had an ethical system, and it also informed our moral views as, as persons. Grace, in that context, was seen against the backdrop of sin. This is history. In other words, as believers, we saw the grace of God, and I love the way Micheline did communion this morning, beautiful stuff, well done, excellent. Because what it did, it made us realise again, it made me remember the reason we do communion. We do communion because Jesus took our sin on himself. And so the backdrop for sin, or for grace I should say, has always historically been human sin. Grace was seen against that backdrop and it was accepted with a clear code of ethics or commandments by which civilization lived. That's the thing that we measure all things against as, as believers. And of course, we come to a position ultimately where we say, we don't measure up. We can't do it. We can't keep the commandments. And we're actually meant to come up with that answer. That's the right answer. Because until we come to that place... The death of Jesus has no value for us. This, is, this notion is biblical and it's well articulated right throughout the, the Bible and particularly in the New Testament. And no more than through the person of Paul the Apostle and he says here in Romans chapter 6. And we're going to look at 23 verses from Romans 1. He says this, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? So Paul asks a bunch of rhetorical questions. Like every good preacher, he doesn't give everyone all the answers. He asks them the questions and then allows their conscience and the Holy Spirit within them to answer the questions. You see, we have the onus of responsibility, each one of us, to follow through on the biblical instructions for living. When you get to heaven, you won't be able to say the preacher said this or that internet sermon that I heard told me that or God TV said something else. No, you're going to stand before God on your own. You'll stand there and you'll give an account for your life and the only thing that will stand between you and eternity will be the person, Jesus. That's the only person, the only thing that separates you from everybody else is the person Jesus. 
So we have an onus of responsibility to follow through on biblical instructions because one day we will be held account for those things. This is a choice we make and it should be accompanied by a strong inner resolve to please God. You see, guys, we live to please God. That really is an act of worship. We had some great worship this morning. The presence of God was thick. I really found it difficult to stand up after worship this morning. But that won't get you into heaven either. And that alone isn't worship. The life of a worshipper is a life that lives to please God. And so Romans goes on in in verse 3 to say this. Paul says, Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So the Christian life, again, identifies with that act of death through Jesus. Baptism is a great symbolic picture of, of, of death. It basically has the person going down into water, represents the old life going into death. And then as the person comes out of the water, it's representative of their new life in Christ. Guys, we can say that it's only through the cross that our sin is paid for, and baptism is a very visual picture of the cross. You see, sin never goes unpunished. And again, I love what Micheline said about that this morning. When we come to Jesus, the punishment for our sin is borne by him. The cost is paid by him. There's no such thing as a free meal. It's another way of putting it. John Howard, I think, made that one famous. The bottom line is somebody has to pay the bill. And in the case of our sin, Jesus paid the bill. Paul goes on to say that if we die with Christ, we will also live with Christ. If we die in Jesus, we are raised in Jesus as well. He then goes on in verse 5 to say, If we've been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be, be united with him in his resurrection. Because the Christian life is a new life. It's an absolutely new life. God doesn't do a restoration on us. He doesn't patch up the broken old life. Because the old life of sin has no place anymore. It's done away with. It's buried. The expectation is that we will no longer live by the ethics and morals determined by the old life that comes from the world. And so everything changed when you come to Jesus. Your whole ethical system was rattled and shaken and fall, falls away and a new one raises up in Jesus. Verse 6 of Romans 1 says this, For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ... We believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. And verse 10. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. And then here it is in verse 11. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. So how do we do this? Again, Paul goes on to describe, or to even better, to prescribe the new way of living. In verse 12, he says this, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master because you are not under law but under grace. Remember, as I said before, grace isn't cheap. It came at a great cost. And grace means that God 
will exercise his mercy, sometimes in ways that we don't appreciate or love. He'll do things to bring us into life. The ultimate mercy of God is a long game. It's a big picture. It isn't a matter of letting us off the hook on, the, on those things that, that speak to our ethical systems. This is both a wonderful and daunting thing, guys. God's mercy will often be seen to break your legs so that you can't walk in the wrong direction. That's how the mercy of God works. The fact that Paul sees this, that his, that the fact that he sees that God's grace is so dangerous should inform the way we live our lives because the grace of God will stop at nothing to, to protect us. He goes on in verse 15. What then shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one to whom you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. And so we as believers... If we give ourselves to the world and we live by its laws and we live by its ethical systems and we develop our morality based on the world, we're going to be in deep trouble. We're going to be in serious trouble because when we come to Christ, we're called to leave the world. That's the essence of repentance. In fact, when we become Christians, we step out of the system of the world and we step into the system of, the hev of heaven. Jesus said we can't serve two masters. He said it very clearly in Matthew 6. He was referring here specifically to money, but the principle applies to every part of life. He says you can't serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be destroyed, devoted to one, I should say, and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You cannot serve both God and the world. These systems are directly in conflict with each other. In verse 18 of uh, Romans 1, Paul goes on to say this. You've been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I put this in human terms because you are weak in your natural selves. Just as you used to offer the parts of your bodies in slavery to impurity... And to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer them in slavery to righteousness, leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. Verse 21, what benefit did, did you reap at that time? From the things you are now ashamed of, those things result in death. But now you've been set free from sin and have become slaves to God. The benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. As we said before, the ways of God are very different to the ways of the world. And every now and then, we have to set ourselves apart from the world and take a reset. He finishes off in verse 23 by saying, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Again, one system of ethics leads to death the other system leads to life so that's that's biblical ethics in a nutshell now it's a much bigger picture obviously we've just taken 66 books of the bible and crunched it in five seconds the ethical the ethical message of scripture goes way beyond that and the world's recognized it for centuries so of those 50 point something percent of people that identify as Christians, we know that most of those people aren't actually church attending Christians. In fact, the numbers come down to single digits of a percent in terms of church membership, which probably translates to a more accurate picture. But the world has accepted the ethical system of Scripture largely. And if we go back 50 years... What we discover there is that the census 50 years ago showed that just over 80% of Australians chose to identify as Christian. 
So those numbers have changed dramatically over the years. World ethics look very different to that. So the ethics of the world have a whole different way of, of measuring the way we do life. Where is our authority on ethics is Jesus and his word. The world ethics are on the individual and what the individual says. In other words, your view of morality is just as real as mine or your next door neighbours or the next person or whoever else. Your truth is real to you. My truth is true to me. And in essence, what we're talking about here is narcissism, which is the religious authority of the world. So basically, the system of ethics of Scripture points to Jesus. The system of ethics of the world points to you. You determine what is an ethically correct thing to do. What we've seen over the... And again, I come back to the question, what in the world is happening? If we look at the world now, these two positions are in direct contrast. The equilibrium point has been met. So we're at 50-50. We're at the halfway mark. Christian ethics are falling. World ethics are rising. And we are now stepping into enemy territory. And we're going to notice the difference from here on in. What we've seen recently, and you'll, most people here will be aware of this, there's a thing called identity politics that's taken place. And this is the new way of measuring which is morally right and which isn't. Who has got it right and who hasn't. And if you don't have it right, you've got to get with the people that do have it right because they're speaking louder than you are. And so identity politics points to particular groups of people and it says their system of ethics is more noble than yours. Because there are more of them or because they're the loudest voice, you need to get on board with them and do the right thing. Have you heard that term recently? We've all heard it, haven't we? And so this thing is applied to every area of life. It's applied to science, to medicine, to politics, to business, to sexuality, to, to families, to the whole thing. And it all comes back to identity politics. The very notion of self-sacrifice for the common good gives way to self-interest of a particular group. If you don't mimic what that group's doing, you're on the out. And you could be sinning against society and ultimately you could be committing a crime against humanity. I want us to look just, at, just now at the book of Judges because what I want you to realise and help us to remember this morning is that none of this is new. It's happened before. It's taken place millennia ago. And what we're seeing now is no different to what we had back then. And so we're going to go back to the book of Judges in the Old Testament and from chapter 2. Let me just grab a quick drink. Someone in the room's doing all the talking and they're getting thirsty. Judges chapter 2 and from verse 10. It says, After that a whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. So that's really where Australia's at right now. A generation's grown up that didn't know God. Furthermore, they didn't know the teachings of their parents. It goes on, verse 11. Then the Israelites did evil in the, in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. They provoked the Lord to anger because they forsook him and worshipped Baal and the Asherahs. Interesting that, th that those two particular gods are mentioned. Baal was the, the god to whom Israel uh, and the surrounding nations, firstly, but Israel, secondly, sacrificed their children to. And so we're seeing the worship of Baal rise up again in the 21st century. And it's outplaying itself in things like abortion, you know, all those areas where kids are given over to the state, basically, 
in, in uh, sexuality, in education, in all sorts of other areas. So those gods are rising up again. That's just my little commentary. Verse 14. In his anger against Israel, the Lord handed them over to raiders who plundered them. He sold them to their enemies all around, whom they were no longer able to resist. In other words, the world had come into Israel. Uh, where are we? Resist. Verse 15. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them. Just as he had sworn to them, they were in great distress. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshipped them. Unlike their fathers, they quickly turned from the way in which their fathers had walked and the way of obedience to the Lord's commands. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he, he was the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord had compassion on them as they groaned under those who oppressed and afflicted them. Verse 19. But when the judge died, the people returned to ways even more corrupt than those of their fathers, following other gods and serving and worshipping them. They refused to give, give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. Therefore the Lord was very angry against Israel and said, Because this nation has violated the covenant that I laid down for their forefathers and has not listened to me, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations Joshua left when he died. And verse 22. I will use them to test Israel and see whether they will keep the way of the Lord and walk in it as their forefathers did. The Lord had allowed those nations to remain. He did not drive them out once by giving them into the hands of Joshua. So we're being confronted by this very scenario again where the church has rolled over and we've basically allowed others to dictate morals and ethics. And so gradually what's happening is that we're seeing a changing of guards. We're seeing a new generation grow up in the church that doesn't know scripture. We're seeing a new generation that doesn't appreciate the, the basis for the, the, the ethical systems the world has previously lived under. And we've seen a, a, a new generation grow up that has connected itself to the world and is now deriving many of its um, morals and ethics from the world system. And so right back at the very beginning of the talk, when I said it's just not fair, we're now seeing a generation of Christians that are using that very language. And we're using it to talk about our own situation. Four times in the book of Judges, we hear that there was no king in Israel in those days. Four times. There was no king in Israel in those days. I want to put it to you that in the current context... And as a Christian, that statement applies to God himself. You see, we now live in the kingdom of God, don't we? We come under the kingdom of God. Remember, the kingdom of God is the rule of God. And so we're in a situation where the world now says, there is no Jesus in the world in these days. Because we've chosen another We've crowned another, another king. We're living under another system. With no centralized government and only tribal leaders who fought for the interests of their tribal groups in the book of Judges, what we saw was that there was fighting going on and there was all sorts of immorality. And ultimately, the true king, God, gave them over to the enemy. And they got plundered and they got beaten up and things went really seriously wrong. So in this context, God raised up judges to lead the people out of bondage after they had repented and come to him in prayer. 
The judges then re-established justice through the law. And the ethical and moral code of God was restored during the time of the judges. Again, fast forward to 2021. We're now in a situation where the Lord is raising up men and women around the world to remind us of where we've come from. And it's time to start listening. Now, I'm not suggesting that we listen to every whack job prophet around the world that develops their own ministry and has their own dot-com website. I'm not suggesting that. But God is raising up people around the world now that are calling the church back to repentance. And as we come back to God and show the world again what this thing looks like, I believe that this cycle may not be the last one before the return of Jesus. We could see things marginally improve. Now, why do we want to see that? Well, we don't want to see it because we want to save the world because the world's dead, remember? We want to see it because God is patient. God's waiting that every single person that should come back into the kingdom can come. And we have a, we have a role to play, God, guys. Our job is to call people back to Christ. We should be delaying the coming of Jesus as long as we can because we've got so many people coming to God. But there is a time coming, obviously, that the scripture says where it's all over where everything stops and the whole gig ends at that point. And anyone that's not in the kingdom at that time, it's too late. It's the end. So God's called us, the church, to stand up again as judges. Now you've heard it said, do not judge your brother. And there's a context for that. But we're called to judge the world. Because the world is now in a place that's very dangerous. Where it's virtually been handed over to the enemies of God's kingdom. And so God's re-establishing judges. And I believe that some of them are here in this church. That he's, he will give people in the church platform to speak into all the realms of the world. Remember we've spoken about politics recently. Well, there are other realms that we live in. We live in education. We live in business. We live in the arts. We live in sport. We live in religion. We live in the church. God wants to inform those realms of the world. And it's not limited to those. There are many realms. He wants to inform them and establish judges to call the world back to him. To re-establish a system of ethics that people can actually come and measure up against. And have a plumb line and not measure it by themselves. History really does repeat itself. As you guys, I know many of you have, have read uh, Jonathan Kahn's books. And one of the things that he speaks about is the recurring nature of history and how things that are happening today can be seen in the Old Testament and reflected in what we see today. This has all happened before. And it's time that we, it, it's time to get with the program. And so again, today, what we see is that tribalism has become rife. Depending on which tribe you're in, depends on where your ethical system sits. So if you're in the green tribe, you gather around the environment and probably a whole bunch of other things that they hadn't intended on. If your tribe is in uh, open sexuality, let's put it that way, then you're going to gather around that and that becomes the center of your ethical system. And what we're seeing now is that there's a whole bunch of tribal systems arising and it goes back to Judges chapter 2. In this context, God will rise up judges if we allow him to. He will re-establish his government. Now I'm not talking about triumphalism again. I'm not talking about post-millennialism or amillennialism. I'm talking about God re-establishing his rule in his people, which was always his intention. So things have repeated themselves. History's repeated itself. Tri tribalism's rife. My question is, are we prepared for him to raise us up as judges, to turn the world and especially the church back to God? I think it's happening. I'm sensing that it's happening. 
Some of you don't know, but I've started meeting with just a few pastors and we've developed quite a strong friendship. And that group now is developing and it's growing into 10 or 20. And it's developing into 50. And we're having a meeting soon where we expect that it could be anywhere between 50 and 100 pastors gathering. Just because we're concerned about some of these issues. And we believe that God's restoring his government in his people again. You see, I'm not talking about extending God's government over the world, though that could happen by extension. What I'm talking about here is re-establishing the government of God over his church. God wants his church back. For too long, we've been flirting with the world. For too long, we've been saying, it's just not fair. And we've, when we say that, it's all about us. And so we're playing those tribal games again. If God doesn't turn the church back to God, we are in serious trouble. You see, the judges were an interesting bunch. They were people like Gideon, Deborah, Samson. They were people whose characters were all over the shop, but God used them to judge the nation of Israel. Many of them were people just like you and I, who were called by God to bring people back to him and to re-establish the government of Christ. I want to finish off this morning, guys, by saying this thing has to be all about Jesus. For the last couple of weeks, you might have thought, oh, Rob's off on some bender and he thinks he's some kind of fire and brimstone preacher. Guys, I just want to bring us back to Jesus. I'm seeing more and more and I'm hearing more in my quiet time that this is the only answer we have. In the end, no system, no code will bring the world back from its death. It's doomed. It's heading for destruction. But we have to bring the church back under the government of Jesus. We've got to come back to him because he is, he is the king. Let's finish off with two scriptures. First from Romans chapter 7 and verse 12. And Paul says, So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. Did, did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. In order that sin might be recognized as sin, it produced death in me through what was good, so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. In other words, repugnant, horrible and ugly. Verse 14, We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, slot, sold as a slave to sin. So as we finish up, I want us to think about how we have viewed grace. You see, grace has got a pretty big rap over the last several years. And the downside of that has been that the law of God has taken a hiding. But I hope, hopefully we've seen this morning that we can't even measure sin without knowing the law. We can't even realize what Jesus has done for us by understanding that his law is absolutely perfect. Only Jesus and a relationship with him can change individuals, families and nations and do away with tribalism once and for all. Let's finish off with John chapter 14 and verse 6. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Guys, this morning, it's all about you and I. It's about us re-establishing the kingship of Jesus over our church. Now, I don't think we're in a terrible place when it comes to that. I think we're doing pretty well. But I think we can also do better. And as I said before, as I've mixed with other pastors in recent times, and this thing's grown in a matter of weeks, there's some, there's some real legs underneath it. There's something special happening in our city. As we, what I see there is that the common denominator that's taking place is that Jesus is being re-established as king. And all those tribal leaders that we've listened to, their voices have got to be quiet when we come to that place. So guys, again, there's two ethical systems. One of them is determined by the word of God. The other one is determined by the world 
which ultimately comes down to us. We have to reject one of those systems in favour of the other, and I think we know where we sit. But we've got to do it, and we have to do it strongly. We can't get sucked in to the religion of self. So this morning, let's stand together.